My name is Wendy Singer, and I am Director of Education at the museum, the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. This is our third in a book series um, of our One Book, One Club book club. And we have a very, very, very special program for you here tonight. I would like we, tonight we are going to be meeting with Estelle Laughlin, who is one of our incredible speakers on our Speakers Bureau. And tonight she is going to be talking about one of her books. Um, and she's going to be talking about one of our books. And then we are going to open it up to a Q&A. So without further ado, and I'll remind you of that when we get back to it, but without further ado, I would like to introduce Estelle, so she can tell you a little bit about herself and her book. Welcome, Estelle. Thank you. Uh, I want to take a minute to thank Marcy Larson and Wendy Singer and Sierra Wolf for making all the complicated arrangements to make this wonderful program possible. I want to thank the museum for giving voice to those whose voices were stopped and for giving voice to the, the, the people who are, who are in harm's way today. And of course, my deepest thanks to all the participants and for your interest in my book, I Feel Humble. Why this book? I actually never thought of myself as a writer, although I'm working on my third book now. I, um, uh, after I retired, I joined a group of friends and we were just going to write whatever entered our minds. And for some reason, uh, the book wrote itself. 74 years have passed since I was liberated from a concentration camp. I don't remember where I last put my glasses, yet I remember clear as day events that changed my sunny childhood into inferno and killed nearly everyone I knew and loved. I asked myself, how did my mother, my sister and I, how did we survive with love for humanity, with compassion and joy of life. Life should be lived joyfully. Um, seeing the child that I was through the eyes of an old woman I am now, I see a brave, resilient, wise girl who recalled the wonderful memories of her pre-war and also the heroic people in the ghetto and cast them as proof that they were and that there always will be righteous people. Um, and that's how my book was uh, uh, became a reality. <coughs> Thank you so much, Estelle. I wanna see if Marcy is here. And if not, I'm I'll continue. Here. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> So, um, sorry, I had a Zoom problem. Um, many of you know me, many of you do not. I'm Marcy Larson. I'm the VP of Marketing and Business Development at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. And um, welcome, welcome, welcome to our One Museum, One Book discussion with Estelle. I think Wendy kicked us off with the first question, um, which was talk a little bit about how your book was right. Am I caught up at this point? Yep. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask a couple of more. Did you give all the instructions as well? When? I did, but we'll do it. Yes. So let's do okay. it one more time, Marcy, just in case, because a few people came in late. Okay. So um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to continue on and ask Estelle a couple of more questions just to get us going. And then I'm going to turn it over to this group to ask any questions. So what I would ask you to do is use the um, raise the hand function at the very bottom of your screen 
And then if you, so to find that, you would click on the participants and then you'll see the raise your hand button. And then that was the top of the participant list and I will call on you. At that point, unmute yourself and ask Estelle your question. And we'll go for an hour. And I just got this note that says my internet is unstable. So when we pop off, we take over. So. You got it. Okay. So um, the second question I had for you before we hand it over to the group was, what was it like to relive your life experiences through this writing process? It was very painful, but it was also very rewarding. Um, you know, it is sometimes in the deepest depth of suffering that one realizes um, the meaning of life, uh, the, the splendor of seeing a new sunrise, um, the, 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 the preciousness of family, of friends, of, of, of um, things that we take for granted. I also, it was um, a very important to me to recall uh, that even in the darkest places, um, love and courage shine through people. And I hope that my readers take it away from the little vignettes, from the little descriptions of the of the uh, of the authors of the writers of the teachers who risk their lives to uh, spend time with children in cold rooms and teach them to hold on to their imaginations and to trust in love and in, in love uh, i described that owning a book was an act of defiance you see, um, it is very important to recognize that the people in the ghettos and the people in the camps did fight back. We were not really victims in the sense that we gave up our humanity. Even when a gun is held to your head, you still have a choice. Uh, how are you going to face uh, whatever you have to face. Um, we, I, I knew, we knew that we were innocent. We understood that those who uh, tortured us would have to uh, live for the rest of their lives with what they were, uh, with, with the acts that they were doing, and that they would have to explain it to, to, their, to, to, to generations that came, would follow. Um, so, um, it is, it's in that sense, we were, we were, there was a tremendous moral and spiritual fighting and moral and spiritual resistance, uh, that actually Jewish people are well versed into holding on to, to, to love, to believe in, 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 in uh, there is a, a morality. There is that there are ethical and moral standards. I think that love and truth and and morality are synonymous. Mm -hmm. so, and to be able to endure uh, such tortures, you had to hold on to meaning. Yeah, that's published this book to until 2008. What was it like to be an older author to say, I'm going to write this book, I'm going to pen to paper and tell this story? Was it difficult? And what led to that decision? Well, I, as I pointed out, I never thought of myself as a writer. And I did not uh, sit down with the idea of writing the book. Uh, the, um, I, but writing has become a very important part of my life. Um, writing opens one's mind, uh, opens uh, 
make makes one question one's own belief in in whatever you hold to be true. Uh, it it helps you explore and question and 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 do research. So you see, you're never too old to be curious. She must be off, so she's struggling, but that's why we have two people on here and um, we're a team. So while I want to invite anyone who has a question to raise their hand in the chat fun function, I mean in the participants function, you click participants and you can raise your hand. If you are having trouble with that, you can send me a chat, Wendy Singer, and let me know and I will call on you. In the meantime, we have some other wonderful questions um, that I wanted to ask you about. Did writing the book provide any clarity or realizations that you might not have known previously? I guess a, a realization, a clarity is that suffering does not have to drive you to anger and despair that suffering can teach you to love more deeply and to be compassionate and to value life, all life, to recognize that we are like one family, all humanity is. If uh, any member of the family suffers, everyone suffers. And I think that is also true about the world that, uh, um, that, that, that we are all part of like one family. Thank that you, Estelle. Care for oneself, so, for everyone, if we want to feel whole. Wonderful. And we have a hand raised. Linda Zolt, you can unmute your microphone and go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Estelle. Hello. How are you today? Thank you, fine. Okay, good. You know, this is the third time I've read this book. I not only liked it so much, I bought a second copy and gave it away. Um, I was listening to something from the U.S. Museum and they said, oh, one of our speakers. I went, no, no, she's my speaker. You can't <laughs> take a soul away from me. She's my speaker. I think that the words you use are just they're amazing. Your, your language in, in such a not beautiful place is beautiful. It's just, it's, it's an incredible book. And today, what a day to be talking about it, huh? September 1st. And it's just, thank you for writing it. Thank you for speaking. I've heard you speak many times at the museum. Thank you for speaking. I think you're a wonderful, very special woman. Thank you for your kind words. I'm very touched. Thank you for being you. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Linda, for a wonderful um, comment. Do we have an, another question from the group for Estelle? Um, there's a question that came in my chat um, that I'll read out. Estelle. Yeah. Were there any upstanders who helped you endure during your experience? The upstanders were every, all the people in my community who held on to their spirits, who held, who, uh, who, who continued to be human, who continued to be decent to their neighbors, who continued to, to hold on to that which is best in them, to hold on to, to love and compassion. So uh, everyone in the uh, love like hate is taught. Uh, and I was fortunate to have lived in a community that was very nurturing. Thank you for that, Estelle. Um, another question? Not in my chat right this at this moment. And we just want to remind folks to raise your hand or send me a chat, Wendy Singer, and I will read the questions. 
Um, I will ask a question while everyone is thinking. Um, Estelle, your your father in your book is so shown to be such a a brave and good man. Um, what impact has he had on your life today? My father, to me, symbolized uh, love, truth, morality. He was to me like a like a mantra. Like, like the current in a stream, yes, there is a difference in with that which is best in us and that which is cruelest in us, neither one purges the other. But he, he, I, he was a very consistent um, figure in my life. He was my pillar. I, uh, I counted, I, I would look into his eyes for reassurance, for stability, for, for comfort, for, for confidence. And the last time I saw him, uh, it, it, obviously you read the book. It, 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 he, I, I saw him under very horrible, uh, he was, torn away from us and yeah and, and yes yet yet that stability helped me overcome and to believe and to help and to live life joyfully and and uh and with love and not anger well, we could feel the pain of that moment in the book, and we could also feel it as you spoke. So thank you for revisiting that with us. I know that can be difficult. Um, I see a hand raised from Joel Goldman. Joel, would you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yes. Uh, first of all, we enjoyed the, reading the book very much, my wife and I, and thank you for writing this. Um, I noticed in the book, um, that you gave uh, that your two cousins, Max and David, I believe, were instrumental in your um, living, quite frankly, uh, from 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 the camp on. Um, do you still do you still stay in touch with their families? Yes, yes, I I do. He has wonderful children and grandchildren, and I love them deeply. And yes, I am in touch with them. That's great. That's great. Very nice. And do, do your <clears throat> do your children and grandchildren uh, interact with them too, or or just you? You know, uh, no, they interact not often because everyone lives in a different part of the United States. Yeah, of course. Right. There is not. There is a strong. I I believe. I, I cannot speak for them. But I believe that there is an emotional and a family bond. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. So I uh, was checking in. I was back and forth to give everyone a chance. I see a hand. Marcy, I'm so sorry, Marcy. I'm going to take it because you're breaking up and we're only hearing every other word. Um, but we have a question raised from Courtney Sturgeon. Courtney, if you want to unmute yourself, we'll take your question. Hi, Estelle. Thank you so much for writing this book. And I first heard your story on Coffee with Survivor on the Facebook page, the museum's Facebook page, and was so inspired by it. Um, like so many of the survivors' stories, I find such great inspiration from the words you've shared with us about love and forgiveness. But um, being a young professional, it's so difficult to talk with particularly um, my professional group and friends who are not familiar with the Holocaust and the survivors' stories. And it seems to them that they have difficulty approaching survivors, asking them questions, or anyone really who has such knowledge like you do about what happened, but most importantly, um, what you did after, which is to live a beautiful life. So how would you suggest that young people 
um, approach survivors, ask them questions, and I'd like them to learn of your inspirational story. How would you tell younger people to get interested in the survivors' stories? I think that what is important is uh, where the question comes from. If you ask with compassion and love, it will be heard with compassion and love. Uh, I say it with, based on some of my ex experiences that sometimes questions seem to come from a place that make me uncomfortable. And then when I ask myself, and of course I am not a mind reader, my, but I sense sometimes a, a, a kind of a, a curiosity that looks for excitement. But when, I, when somebody asks if our life was not an adventure, we learned wisdom from, from our suffering. Uh, you can snatch wisdom from suffering, and everybody suffers. Uh, you don't have to be uh, hit with a sledgehammer to feel. Uh, life, it, the, everyone experiences at some point or another loss or rejection. So I feel that suffering is part of life. Misery is a choice. You, uh, if you accept, if you accept the fact that suffering and sadness is part of life, but sadness does not have to separate you from joy. Uh, I think that allowing yourself to feel sad will also allow you to laugh more heartily. So that's all part of life. Uh, uh, and it does not have to destroy you. It can make you more compassionate and more loving. Uh, and whatever you, whatever, wherever one fits in along the range is fine. That's where one is. But if it is asked with, with love, if it's asked with compassion, it's perfectly all right. Um, you know, suffering needs witness. So I think that the people who hear a genuine interest, it kind of unites them with humanity. Like in, when we were in the camps, we were so isolated. It was impossible to believe that only a few rabbit huts away from us people were sailing on silver lakes and children were eating around tables as children should. And nobody heard our cries and nobody came to our help. It it, I would have only known that somebody cared. My mother in front of the crematoria, I write about it, I think in the book, said to us, the world has a conscience. And we thought in front of the crematorium, she must be out of her mind. And she said, you'll see, it will survive. You'll see that the Nazis' children and their children's children for generations will be asking, where was your conscience? And they are asking that question. And I am ever so grateful for it because understanding is essential. Revenge is meaningless, it's self-destructive. Anger is meaningless, it's self-destructive. Understanding, we are all left with the legacy to understand. Without understanding, there is no progress. Thank you, Estelle. We had a woman, Gitta, your hand was up and then it went away. I'm gonna ask um, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, Gitta Balinski. Go ahead. Hi, Estelle. Hey. It's a pleasure to meet you. Let me introduce myself. I am uh, your cousin's daughter. Oh, cousin's daughter. 
Nebraska, yes. Phil's oh. daughter. And my sister, bless her heart, introduced me to the idea that you were going to be speaking tonight. And I felt that this was an opportunity when I would get to meet you. I believe I met you more than 50 years ago when I was a child. Then I reunited then. Right, right. And I knew your sister, Frida. We spent time with her when we uh, came to visit in New York. And one of the questions that uh, one of the gentlemen asked you was about your family and if you are in touch with Max and David and their family. And I just want you to know that you have always been in our hearts and in our mind. We had the pleasure, I don't know if you remember, many, many years ago of hosting your mother in Omaha, Nebraska. My mother and father were delighted to have her come and spend some time with us. Of course, I was a small child then, but it was a pleasure to get to know her. And I'm so happy to have had this opportunity to see you once again. And I cherish your voice. I cherish your um, talking to me now. Okay, we 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 go back a long way, and I, I you know I wanted you and others to understand that all your all the survivors have a wonderful legacy, and thank God in our family we have a huge extended family that have, has come out of the ashes of the Holocaust. And I just wanted to give you that strength to know that uh, we love you, we care about you, and we're so happy to be able to see you and be part of your life again. I embrace every word that you said, and I want you to know that you had a very singular father, Tisho, and a very wonderful mother. Yes. And I am not surprised that he has wonderful children. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. That was so, so wonderful. Um, and what a wonderful surprise. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to call on our next person. Um, we have someone who raised their hand who's under Estelle's name, but it's not Estelle. It's a friend or family member, no doubt. Um, and you can unmute yourself if that is you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fern Zagor, and I'm actually very teary. Oh. I am, um, I'm Estelle's niece. I'm Frida's daughter. Um, and it's so good to hear from Gita, and I saw Hetty was there too, and I know that there are other family members who are on this Zoom call. Um, they all have the name of Estelle because we all used Estelle's invitation to, um, to join the Zoom. Um, and I did want to share a few thoughts. Uh, Estelle described how important family is. And that has passed on from generation to generation. Lador Vador, the sense of, of family is so important to all of us. And that has come from Estelle, from my mother, Frida, from all of us, and we are still all bonded, even if we don't see each other all the time. This past, not this summer, but last summer in 2019, my husband and I, and we talked about Max and David, Max's children, um, Jack, Stanley, and Carrie, we all went to Europe to trace our parents' Holocaust roots. And we used Estelle's book as our guide I cannot begin to tell you how accurate it was, <laughs> um, how meaningful it was uh, using that as we went through various areas of Poland, starting in Warsaw and seeing the Warsaw Ghetto and where they lived, going to Majdanek, um, going through the various concentration camps, going through the towns that they escaped to, Jawishitsa, um, Pinchow, where my grandfather, uh, Estelle's father, came from. It was such a powerful, powerful experience and made even more powerful because we had her book, her voice with us every step of the way as we went through and it brought it to life and gave different meaning to it. Our cousins are all very close. Um, 
I am in regular contact with Jack and, and David's children. Both Jack and David are no longer with us. My mother's no longer with us, but we are here and we carry the story, we carry the feelings as we, <clears throat> wherever we go and hopefully we, we pass that down to our children as well. Um, we don't see all of our cousins. Estelle's children are, are um, in all different places in, in America and South America. <laughs> and yet the bond is extremely close. The love of, for life that Estelle talks about, uh, that her father and mother infused her with, uh, has definitely passed on to all of us. Um, and we do love life and we love each other and we love you, Estelle. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. What, a, what an incredible treat this is. Um, I saw, I'm going to do a question in the chat and then Hetty, I know your hand was raised and I'll call on you next. So I'm going to ask the question in the chat and then we'll take one from Hetty. Lynn, Ilana in our audience has a comment and a couple questions. My father was in the Warsaw ghetto being a young adolescent. He never wanted to speak about his experiences at the time during the war when he lost most of his family. Did you speak about it? If so, when did you start to speak about it? It actually took a while for people to open up and talk about their uh, Holocaust experiences. I think that there were reasons why that happened. I, um, I think that um, it's thanks to, to the United States Museum to the, uh, whole, uh, the Illinois uh, Holocaust Museum Education Center, that uh, listeners and people who are asking questions are more sensitive. For instance, when we first came to the United States, and I describe how my mother was looking forward to, uh, she had two siblings here, and we lost everyone the whole family other than the, the, the couple of cousins. And, uh, and so um, very often if she would go shopping to the store, people would ask, why didn't she fight back? So we did fight back. How could she explain to them that we fought back? Uh, when, when we arrived, she was so waiting to see her brother and her two sisters. Wait, if I tell them, they'll understand what happened to Aunt Malka, what happened to Aunt Hannah, and, and all the wonderful uh, nieces and nephews. And they would come back with awkward uh, uh, responses, like we suffered too, we had no chocolate, we had no stocking. They did not mean to be insensitive. I think that it's some, I know that I find myself still, I have to remind myself that to be a good listener, you are not obliged to, to lift the, 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 the sadness. All you are asked is to hear, to be witnessed. And so I, I also sometimes, instead of listening, I give advice. So I know that my cousins and my aunts had all the compassion, but they just didn't know how to ask. Uh, and they didn't know how to listen. To be a good listener, all you have to do is really listen. Uh, so that, that was part of the reason people are also now better informed. They recognize that, uh, that um, to survive, you had to hold on to your humanity. You had to hold on to meaning. You know, when you lose everything, your memories become your possession. We were not a swarm of nameless people. We were not a swarm of people who had no, no, uh, no, there's one 
sorry for digressing. There is a wonderful painting in our museum where I see uh, it's a, a group of, uh, of deportees from the ghetto. Tasteless. I cannot, and I know that the painter meant to say that, that the humanity was erased from the outside. But we were not, that, that, that painting disturbs me greatly because I know that we, 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 had, we had wishes. We were full of hope. We were full of love. We were full of yearning. You know, they can take everything away from you, but not your freedom to feel, not your freedom to be human, not your freedom to dream. And thank God my dreams came true. Some of my grandchildren are probably listening right now. So, uh, and, and yes, so it, it, for some people, it is very difficult to see. But now you find that more survivors are comfortable speaking. And I think more, more listeners are comfortable hearing and comfortable just listening. And so anyone who has any questions should not feel hesitant to ask if it comes from the right place, if it comes with love and, and common humanity. We are all one. Thank you, Estelle. We had a raised hand by Hetty. If you want to unmute yourself, you may ask your question. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I am unmuted. Estelle, dear, um, I don't see you on the screen. You don't see me because I don't have, there you are, dear. Estelle, this is Hetty, the second of the twins. If you remember, Fischl had twins. Yes, my dear, yes. And I can't tell you how touched I am to be able to see you because we did speak at one time many, many years ago. And it's so touching to see you. And it's very exciting, Fern, to have seen you. Uh, we did spend time together way a long time ago in Far Rockaway. Your family was so gracious to me, hosted me in your home. And I too also remember when your mom, Estelle, came to our home and how my father loved your mother so much and treated her with such respect. And it was something so unusual to us because we knew of his past. But to know that he had an aunt that still that is surviving and came to us to visit. I just want you to know how moved I am seeing you and listening to you. And uh, we also have, we have your book, we've read it, right. and uh, very touched by it. You should be well, Estelle. And so <laughs> when my mother came back from the visit, she was so touched by the warmth and the, oh. and the kindness. I, I remember she said the first thing your father did in the morning was to make sure that she had a cup of tea or yeah. something to eat. Uh, your parents were such wonderful people, and I'm not surprised that they had such wonderful children. You wrote so lovingly of them in the book. Uh, I, they yes. Were them. They, yes. Uh, it was. Thank you. Thank it was very moving, and it's very moving to see you. Very moving to hear you, and I hope to see you with all my heart. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, we are Thank witnessing you. some very, this is the best book club ever. It's a book club and a family reunion, and I want to thank you for yes. all including us, because this is absolutely <laughs> incredible. Um, we have, I'm going to take a question from Courtney, who's in the chat, you can unmute yourself, and then I'll go, or Courtney, who's raising her hand, and then I'll go back into the chat, because I see there's another question from a couple other people, so I'll hit that next. Courtney, we're ready when you are. Oh my gosh, thank you to your family, and Estelle especially. It's so beautiful to see your legacy with your family and friends, um, and that is really my question for you. How, after everything you went through, um, being such a loving person, did what would be your your marriage, your parenting advice, <laughs> especially having overcome everything that you had to overcome? Um, were there ever moments that I know every parent must be frustrated with their children at some point? Were there ever moments that uh, were a little bit different for you as a parent because of what you went through? 
I think that being a parent is always very, um, it's, it, it's, it's, you, you want to give that, you want to give, you want to give more, you want to give everything. You never, I think you constantly want I did question myself. I know I was at the beginning, never talked about, uh, uh, about my experiences because I wanted to protect them from, I wanted them not, I didn't want the shadows of my experience to prejudice them. I wanted them to know love before, before they understood um, forgiveness, anger, uh, that the world is not perfect. Uh, that parents are not perfect, parents are human beings. I know that my children were to me a, re a reincarnation of all life. It was touching that which was the most precious and that is most precious in me. I wanted to hear them. I wanted to hear them well. I wanted to, I wanted so much to hear them well and to say what they wanted to hear. I have to rely on the fact that all I can do in the, in, 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 in the, on the, underneath it all is love. I love them un, unquestionably. I, 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 if I ever, if I ever, it's they, they are light they are meaning they and and nobody is perfect i hope that they forgive me for whatever i may have fallen short of and i hope that they love themselves with all they i think that to me they are perfect but if they are not perfect in their own mind, I want them to know that that they are that wherever you are, whoever you are, as long as you hold on to your love, you you're perfect. Wow, wow. Um, we have a question from Debbie. Have you ever gone back to Poland, Estelle? And if so, what was that experience like for you? I was, I was, uh, I was invited to go uh, to Warsaw on the 70th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising with a presidential delegation through the United States Holocaust Museum. It was, I was very frightened to go. I was so afraid that if I returned to the street, where where we were in the bunkers where we were pulled out, I was afraid that um, the impact of the memories would overwhelm me. Um, you know, uh, some people say that that which you most frightened of, you ought to face uh, because in your mind, it's probably worse than the reality is, and it proved to be that way. I was able to recognize that this was then, and this second, and uh, this is now, and this was then. But um, uh, the, the one experience that was extremely healing was um, we one evening we spent at the um, at Tad Bielki, the Grand the Theater in Warsaw. It, it, it's an opera house. Of course, it was destroyed, but it was rebuilt. My mother loved the opera. When she would come, I described when she would come back from the opera, she would fiddle with the cooking and she would sing, and she had a beautiful voice, and she would tell snippets of the story and, and would sing arias. And so we went to the opera. And so there um, on the stage, 
was a very stark stage and three cantors appear and they sing the Kolmedra. It felt so appropriate to sing, to sing the Kolmedra back then. Who was the orchestra that played the Israeli Symphony Orchestra? So that was the future. So that was such a healing separation, uh, the Kolmedra appropriate and life goes on, nothing is forever. And, and so it was a good letting go because, you know, it never ceases to, to amaze me how Jewish people manage to trump history and to continue and to be productive and, and to be productive not only to themselves and to their families, but to the world. And so that was the Kondedra and the symphony playing beautiful music. So wow, a what an experience. experience. Thank you for sharing that. We have another friend or relative who's under your name, so I can't call them by name, but I'm gonna share their comment and question. Estelle, thank you so much for being here with us. I am a teacher. My students often don't understand the concept of resistance beyond physically fighting back. What do you feel, what do you feel like your greatest resistance was during your experience? The greatest resistance is holding on to the self. Uh, if you hold on to the self, you're not vulnerable. You are only vulnerable if you depend on someone else's either uh, praise or recognition. I think that, that and I think ch I, I, children are capable of understanding that the self is, is godly. Uh, the self is not threatened if you, if you, if you hold on to it which is a hard concept and it takes a lifetime. I still am trying to understand that one is not dependent on anyone's approval, uh, on how one appears in anyone's eyes, that the most important and healing thing is to be comfortable and to accept yourself and to forgive yourself. It's all right to make mistakes, it's all right to be wrong, and it's and it's and it's very cleansing to let go of it, and really the past is gone, the future is is, is uh, not real. So all we have is the moment. So if we accept that doesn't matter that I made a mistake, I am here now, and I'm going to cherish it relish it and, and be in, in peace and children are good at I, I work with children. Estelle, this is a question from me. <laughs> Would you be open to being my therapist? Because you give the best advice. I wanted to ask you that. You're incredible. I need to have you in my ear when I get down about myself. You're fantastic. Um, okay, next question. Estelle, yes. how did you find, how did you return to your faith? Before and during the war, did you stop practicing Judaism? Do you do it now? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, my parents were not religious. They were humanists. I am not religious, but I'm very spiritual. I feel connected with every life. My parents felt connected with every life, uh, with everything that was living. So I, I am a very reverent person. I am not a religious person. Okay, thank you. We have time for just two more questions because I want to make sure we... Um, we get to all of them. Okay, so Estelle, you talked about a painting that you did, not like at the museum. What is one part of the museum you think everybody should see? 
I I think that I can I can, I it's hard for me to really pinpoint because because hum, human human value is is so enormous. Uh, when I see that I what struck me the first time when I walked in was the dome that it was expanding. And to me, that sort of represented freedom. I think that one should look inside themselves when they walk into the museum and ask themselves what they want to hear. There are so many treasures there. I mean, treasures in terms of reflection, of suffering and overcoming. So suffering and overcoming, as I pointed out that I think I said before, is that suffering is part of life. Um, uh, so I, 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 there's so much. I think that what the museum stands for in itself is breathtaking to me because it is encompassing the noblest and the best that is in us. I am also, you know, I am actually new to this museum because I live in Washington. And I am so often reminded when I walk in that this museum was given life at a very difficult, a very, a, a, a very, a very, a very cruel, uh, the march of, of the Ku Klux Klan, right, uh, in, in, in Washington. To me, that is also very symbolic that, that in spite of the fact that people, uh, that there are people who deny that the Holocaust ever happened, um, is the fact that um, history always hears. And we must listen if civilization is to progress, if we are going to find our way out of moral darkness. Yes, yes. So I want to ask you this question before we close. I understand you're, you did not just write one book, but three, and you have a new book coming out this month. Two. Okay. Two. two. Is this My second one is coming out any day now. Uh, well, and, there's always room for three. We can't wait for the third, but let's I'm talk about the second. The third one, and I'm, I, I am so, uh, uh, I am very much interested in, in the subject. So I am absolutely absorbed in what I'm writing now. And I, uh, yes. Tell us a little bit about the book that's about to come out. Okay. What's the title? So we can all write it down. Uh, it's called Hannah, I Forgot to Tell You. Uh, why did I, did I turn to fiction? Um, every time I make, up, make a decision that I'm going to write about something else that captivates me, somehow I am swung around and I end up with the topics that uh, touched me when I was becoming who I am. And so this is about a young person who lives in the Warsaw Ghetto and she escapes from the Warsaw Ghetto and she is passing as a, a non-Jewish person. I, it was very important to me. I was wondering if the rest of the world cares. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I never, I, 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 I had to search this out and to make this connection with the righteous people. I feel, I feel, I feel that they are like, uh, like, uh, like one of the Lama Dvap Sadikim. Who, who performed uh, Tikkun Paul on the saving of the world. I think that righteous people 
are the healers of the world. And, and interestingly, uh, there were only 36 righteous people. Nobody knows who they were. Could be you, could be me, could be anyone, could be anyone who comes to the museum. And uh, so, yes, I am I'm looking for the righteous. So I see them all around me and, uh, and I, want, I want to recognize it. Um, the people that are in my book are, are fictitious, but not entirely. You know, it is strange that people who die don't vanish from our lives. They appear in chairs and you reach out to them and they vanish, but not without touching that which is best in me. So I have, I uh, got very carried away about writing in that book about um, um, uh, the smugglers who like little mice crawled under the wall and so risking their life. The wall was smudged with blood so that they could bring a, a meal for, for their parents. I, I never met one personally, but I knew of them and I dreaded for their lives. And I think I, I, could, I admired them. And so they play an important part. And other people like Janusz Korczak, uh, who was, uh, he was a saint. Uh, he was um, a, an author uh, of uh, children's books. He was a pediatrician. He was an educator and he, and, uh, and he ran an orphanage. So I write also quite a bit about his, I fictionalize it, but, uh, but um, what, he, what he meant to the children and how he ran the orphanage, he ran it like a democracy. They had, they had a, um, um, a judges and, 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 and they had a government. So anyway, so yes. And then also it's the righteous families that were, they risked their lives and that whole family. Estelle, thank you so much. I cannot tell you how many wonderful comments are coming through the chat. I will, we share all of them with you because a lot of people want to thank you for your inspiration, your openness, your kindness, and sharing your story with the world. We are so grateful to have spent this lovely hour with you all together. And I just have a couple of quick announcements before we say goodnight. Um, in the chat, you'll notice that I put a link to our programs. Um, so if you want to check out additional programs, please check that link. We'll be posting about our next book club shortly in the next week or two. Um, our next Holocaust program, though, is Thursday, September 12th. It's a lunch and learn at September 10th at 12 p.m. about armed resistance, the case of the Minx ghetto. So I hope you'll join us. Um, until then, um, be well. Remember that the museum is now open Wednesdays through Sundays. It is safe and socially distanced and, and um, the museum staff is doing an incredible job. Um, but if you're not ready to come back in person, check out all of our virtual um, programming and content online. Estelle, thank you so much. And I thank you all so very, very much and I'm very touched by your comments. And thank you for your interest in my book. Thank you for your interest and support of the museum. And thank you for being righteous. Thank you. Thank you, Estelle. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Have a night. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.